It was a cold and rainy night in London. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were sitting in their Baker Street lodgings, reading the newspaper. What a night, Watson said, shivering. I'm glad we're not out in it, indeed, Holmes said. But even on a night like this, there are still crimes to be solved. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Holmes went to answer it, and returned a moment later with a young woman. She was dressed in a tattered shawl and a dirty dress, and her hair was unkempt, Mr. Holmes, she said. I'm so glad you're here. I need your help, of course, Holmes said. What can we do for you, my husband has been murdered, the woman said. I don't know who did it. But I'm afraid for my life, Holmes and Watson listened as the woman told them her story. Her husband, a wealthy businessman, had been found dead in his study. There were no signs of a struggle, and no one had seen or heard anything. The police were baffled, and the woman was convinced that the killer was still out there, waiting to strike again, I'm afraid you're right, Holmes said. This is a very serious matter. We'll need to investigate thoroughly. Holmes and Watson spent the next few days interviewing the woman's friends and family, and searching the crime scene. They found nothing that could identify the killer, but they did learn a few things. The woman's husband had been involved in some shady business dealings. And he had made a number of enemies, it's possible that one of his enemies killed him, Holmes said. But it's also possible that the killer was someone he knew and trusted, the case was a mystery, but Holmes was determined to solve it. He spent hours poring over the evidence, and he eventually came up with a theory. He believed that the killer was someone who had been close to the victim, and that they had killed him for revenge. Holmes and Watson confronted the woman with their theory, and she broke down and confessed. She had killed her husband, she said, because he had been cheating on her. She had been planning to leave him, but she had feared that he would take their son away from her. In a fit of rage, she had stabbed him to death, the woman was arrested and charged with murder. She was eventually found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Holmes and Watson were glad that they had been able to bring the killer to justice, but they were also saddened by the tragedy that had unfolded. It's a sad case, Watson said as they walked back to Baker Street. But at least we know that the woman will no longer be a danger to herself or anyone else, yes, Holmes said. And we can also take comfort in the fact that we were able to bring about justice, the two men continued walking in silence for a few moments. Then, Holmes turned to Watson and said, I'm glad you're here, Watson. I couldn't do this without you, Watson smiled. I'm glad I'm here too, Holmes. It's always an adventure working with you. John Openshaw is a young man who seeks the help of Sherlock Holmes. He tells Holmes that he has received a letter containing five orange pips and the letters KKK on the envelope. This same thing had happened to his uncle, Elias, before his death. Shortly after receiving the letter, Elias was found drowned in a river. John is now afraid that he will meet the same fate as his uncle, Holmes begins to investigate the case and discovers that the KKK referred to a group of former Confederate soldiers who had turned to piracy. This group had a history of sending warnings in the form of orange pips before carrying out their threats. Despite Holmes' efforts, John receives a third letter containing five orange pips. And he soon disappears, Holmes discovers that John has been killed by the Ku Klux, and he takes revenge by causing their ship to be wrecked and killing the entire crew. The story ends with Holmes reflecting on the tragic fate of John and his uncle, and the danger that they faced from the Ku Klux, 
Overall, The Five Orange Pips is a simple and straightforward story that showcases the brilliance of Sherlock Holmes. It is a classic tale of mystery and suspense that keeps the reader engaged until the very end. One misty morning, Sherlock Holmes received a letter from the captain of a large ship that had docked in the port of London. The captain reported a theft that had taken place on board the ship during its voyage from Singapore. The theft was of great value, as it involved a precious diamond necklace belonging to a wealthy passenger on board. The necklace had been kept in a locked safe in the passenger's cabin, and the only people who had access to the cabin were the passenger, her maid, and the ship's crew, Sherlock Holmes and his trusty partner, Dr. Watson, set out to investigate the crime. They boarded the ship and began their investigation by interviewing the crew and passengers. Holmes quickly deduced that the thief was someone who had knowledge of the ship's layout and routines. He also determined that the thief had not acted alone, as the safe had been locked and the necklace was too large to be easily concealed. After examining the scene of the crime, Holmes and Watson found a strand of long, black hair on the floor of the cabin. They carefully collected it as evidence and sent it to the forensics lab for analysis. While waiting for the results, Holmes and Watson continued their investigation, questioning the crew members and analyzing the ship's records. They discovered that one of the crew members, a young woman named Maria, had been acting strangely during the voyage. She had been seen sneaking around the passenger cabins, and her behavior had aroused suspicion among her fellow crew members. Holmes and Watson decided to confront Maria and ask her about her actions. She initially denied any involvement in the theft, but under further questioning, she broke down and confessed. Maria had been recruited by a notorious gang of thieves, who had promised her a share of the loot in exchange for helping them carry out the theft. She had used her knowledge of the ship's layout to gain access to the passenger's cabin and had used a hairpin to pick the lock on the safe. Maria led Holmes and Watson to the hiding place where the necklace was stored, and they recovered it intact. The gang of thieves were arrested and brought to justice, thanks to the sharp investigative skills of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. The grateful passenger rewarded Holmes and Watson generously for their services, and the case became one of their most celebrated triumphs. As the investigation progressed, Holmes and Watson learned more about Maria's involvement in the theft. They discovered that she had been coerced into working with the gang of thieves, who had threatened to harm her family if she did not comply with their demands. Maria had been struggling to make ends meet, and the thieves had preyed on her vulnerability to recruit her into their scheme. Holmes and Watson realized that Maria was not the mastermind behind the theft, but rather a pawn in a much larger criminal operation. They decided to use Maria's cooperation to track down the gang of thieves and bring them to justice. With Maria's help, Holmes and Watson were able to identify the leader of the gang. A notorious criminal known as the Black Hand. They set a trap for him, pretending to be interested in buying stolen goods, and were able to capture him red-handed. The Black Hand was a cunning and dangerous criminal, but he was no match for the brilliant detective work of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. They were able to dismantle his criminal operation, and he was sentenced to life in prison. The wealthy passenger who had lost the diamond necklace was overjoyed to have it returned to her, and she rewarded Holmes and Watson handsomely for their services. But for Holmes and Watson, the real satisfaction came from bringing justice to Maria and the other victims of the thieves' crimes. The case became one of the most famous in Sherlock Holmes' career, and it cemented his reputation as one of the greatest detectives of all time. Holmes and Watson continued to work together on many more cases,
but they always remembered the case of the stolen diamond necklace and the brave woman who helped them solve it. The year is 1895. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are called to investigate the murder of a sailor on a whaling ship. The sailor, Peter Carey, was found dead in his cabin, his throat slit. There are no signs of forced entry, and no one saw or heard anything suspicious. Holmes and Watson begin their investigation by examining the crime scene. They find a blood-stained knife on the floor, but there are no fingerprints on it. They also find a notebook in Carrie's cabin, but it is written in a code that they cannot decipher. Holmes and Watson interview the other sailors on the ship, but no one seems to have any information about Carrie's murder. They eventually track down a man named Liam Hurtley, who had been arguing with Carrie on the night of the murder. Hurtley denies killing Carey, but he does admit to stealing a valuable whale tooth from him. Holmes and Watson eventually realize that the whale tooth is the key to the case. They track down the man who bought the whale tooth from Hurtley, and he tells them that Hurtley told him that he had killed Carey to steal the tooth. With this new information, Holmes and Watson confront Hurtley. Hurtley finally confesses to killing Carey but he claims that he did it in self-defense. He says that Carey had threatened to kill him if he didn't give him the whale tooth back. Holmes and Watson believe Hurtley's story, and they recommend that he be charged with manslaughter rather than murder. Hurtley is eventually sentenced to five years in prison. This case is a good example of Sherlock Holmes's deductive reasoning skills. He was able to solve the case even though there were no witnesses and no clear motive. He did this by carefully examining the crime scene and interviewing the suspects, and by using his knowledge of human behavior to piece together the events that led to the murder. Here are some of the crime-solving techniques that Sherlock Holmes used in this case. Examining the crime scene, Holmes carefully examined the crime scene, looking for any clues that might have been missed by the police. He found the bloodstained knife and the notebook, and he also noticed that the door to Carey's cabin had been unlocked. Interviewing the suspects, Holmes interviewed all of the sailors on the ship, looking for anyone who might have had a motive to kill Carey. He also interviewed Liam Hurtley, who had been arguing with Carey on the night of the murder, using his knowledge of human behavior. Holmes used his knowledge of human behavior to piece together the events that led to the murder. He knew that Hurtley was a violent man, and he suspected that he had killed Carey in self-defense. By using these techniques, Sherlock Holmes was able to solve the case of the murdered sailor and bring the killer to justice. <laughs>